Hello, and thank you for joining today's virtual lecture, Ellen Carey and John Rudder, Art and Technology in Polaroid and Photography. My name is Nicole Hooks, Coordinator of Adult Education Programs here at the New Britain Museum of American Art, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you today. I am delighted to introduce Ellen Carey and John Rudder. Ellen Carey is an educator, independent scholar, guest curator, photographer, and lens-based artist. Since the early 1990s, Ellen has created experimental and abstract works that defy photographic conventions. Ellen's work has been seen in hundreds of group exhibitions and has been the subject of over 70 one-person exhibitions in museums, alternative spaces, universities, colleges, and commercial galleries. Ellen Carey, Struck by Light, represents the largest retrospective of Carey's innovative photo objects and lens-based artwork in a decade, tracing 30 years of her prolific career. Joining Ellen today is John Rudder. John has been a photographer since the early 1970s, majoring in art while attending SUNY Jenna So. He continued his studies at, on the graduate level at the University of Iowa, receiving two master's degrees. It was there that he began specializing in Polaroid materials, most notably his SX-70 construction. Combining photography with painting and collage, Rudder joined Polaroid Corporation in 1978 as senior photographer and later director of the legendary 20 by 24 studio. His own work evolved through large scale polo color image transfers to digital imaging in the mid 1990s. He has taught workshops in Photoshop, Lightroom, Polaroid materials and acoustic painting around the world. In recent years, Rudder has moved into video and filmmaking and is currently working on a feature length documentary titled Camera Ready, the Polaroid 20 by 24 project. Now welcome our distinguished guests, Ellen Carey and John Rudder. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having both of us. It's a pleasure uh, and it's a beautiful day. Um, the My lecture is called Back to the Future. The avant-garde is an address and it represents Photography Degree Zero, which is the name of my Polaroid 2024 practice from 1996 to the present in 2023. Struck by Light is my photogram practice in black and white, darkroom work, as well as color from 1988 to the present in 2023. And Pictus and Writ represents my research scholarship and writing. This is a tradition uh, in our field of artists writing about other artists' work. Um, the avant-garde is an address reference references, there are many, many avant-gardes in the world, but the one I'm going to be particularly talking about is the avant-garde in America vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Paris uh, between the wars going to America, and of course the great invention of photography uh, in, you know, the uh, England and Paris and with Talbot and Anna Atkins in England and Daguerre of Paris, and then of course you know, Polaroid in the 20th century. Edwin Land was also a resident of Connecticut and was born here. So we can go ahead and start the talk. Uh, we'll have room for questions um, at the end. It will be about 40 minutes or so. And John and I will be uh, talking back and forth around this work. I'm showing you work uh, beginning as my student days. Um, go ahead, Nicole, we can start here. And um, again, I went to, I was born in New York, lived in Atlanta, Chicago, back to New York, went to Kansas City Art Institute. And one of the things in art school there was we had a wall and this is around, you know, what is art? Uh, again, remembering in my field, our field of photography, there were many questions about photography. Is it science? Is it art? And in contemporary, I would reference Andy Grumberg's new book called uh, how Photography Became Contemporary Art, uh, which is just out in 2021, uh, the revolution from the pop, from War Warhol and Rauschenberg, et cetera, to the digital age. So we had a wall that we had to work on and we were supposed to use non-traditional materials and respond to kind of respond and call, call and response to the wall. Um, I used, uh, ketchup and mustard bottles from the kitchen, as well as silkscreen inks. And you'll see that working off the wall uh, comes into my uh, creative art making practice down the road and also very interested in color and also 
uh, using different panels, working in, I, you know, in Kansas City, we had a very interesting rotation department through uh, sculpture, ceramics, painting. I looked at a blank canvas that looked back at me. It wasn't until I got into the darkroom via uh, lithography and we had photolitho process and you begin to see the negative and pro positive here, <laughs> excuse me, in this photolitho process. Uh, so that is something that is sort of enters my visual thinking early on as well. Um, we The next picture represents what Cartier-Bresson calls the decisive moment. Uh, there was a small dog, obviously, across the street in Kansas City, and I pointed that to it uh, again. The single frame, the photography is working with a machine, a camera, the circular lens, and the rectangular box. It also references the universal codes of the circle and the square. And here, Cartier-Bresson's decisive moment uh, is that instant frame. The action takes place in front of your eyes, but you're not able to see it later. And this was a kind of eureka moment for me. Next slide. Um, after Kansas City Art Institute, I went to Buffalo, New York, SUNY, and I scaled up. So I've worked with a lot of different cameras, Lumia C330 in this case, and I did a portrait of my mother introducing light as the index clone photography. The word photography itself means P-H-O-S. It is Greek for light and graphis for drawing. And here I'm using a, a mirror to, again, referencing the camera obscura and the circle on her eye uh, echoes sort of the aperture. And these pen light drawings coming up next. Um, which you'll see are iterated later in Man Ray's. Sorry, I'm starting to get a little scratchy throat here. And next slide. And next, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Buffalo was the home of the avant-garde in many ways. The Albright Knox was the first museum to show photography, partnering it with Alfred Stieglitz Gallery. Um, also, we had Hall Walls and Zipa there, and here we are. That's myself on the right, Cindy Sherman's in the middle. There's a group of us, um, and we had Zipa, the Center for Photography and Exploratory Arts, Hall Walls. Next slide. Well, sorry, I'm getting an itch right here. <laughs> Excuse me. And in Western New York was the uh, Albright Knox Biennial, uh, which had just hired Linda Cathcart who was from the University of California, Berkeley, and worked at the Albright Knox. This still continues today. Next slide, please. A pen light drawing from that period, 1996, 1976, uh, excuse me. And you'll see this echoed in my Man Ray drawing. Coming up next. Uh, there was no place for us to show as young artists, and here's a, picture with uh, the Metro uh, bus service there. And there I am on the left with my conceptual portraits there and Cindy Sherman's bus riders. And this was the beginning of the National Endowments for the Arts. So literally there was no place for us to exhibit. Uh, there were no commercial galleries, etc. Next slide. A Polaroid enters my life pretty early on in the 70s there, the SX70, um, just doing you know, my favorite three things in the left panel in the middle, you'll see I'm still drawing and using glitter, nail polish. Next, please, the self-portrait. Um, this is a prototype of an idealing what I look like with different wigs on. So I went to a wig store and it was a collaboration between the owner of the wig store taking pictures of me and using album cover corners to, um, you know, mount those. And th then I used Mylar. So the idea was to be a prototype, uh, you know, life size. Next, please. And SX-70 came out. And the Polaroid, uh, of course, revolutionized our global picture, picture culture, uh, which is now seen in the iPhone. The these uh, painted self-portraits were, again, a breakthrough and was responsible for me getting a CAPS grant, a Creative Artist Program Service Grant. Uh, which allowed me to move to New York City, and these were exhibited 
exhibited at PS1, which had just opened up. Linda Cathcart was the curator. It was called The Painted Photograph. This intervention, next slide, of, of putting paint on a photograph was taboo, but I was borrowing different methods from um, my photo lithos. Here I am wearing black with white, again, introducing the negative and positive, and the gray in the next slide is a monochrome. So black, white, and gray are colors for me. And then the next slide, I am starting to work with color. Here is Wish You Were Here, the Buffalo Avant-Garde of the 1970s. This exhibition was curated in 2011. And we had music, poetry. Uh, Governor Rockefeller was the flagship, made SUNY Buffalo the flagship school. So it was like UC Berkeley at the time. Uh, go ahead, and that documents this. Moving to New York in the late 70s, it, it was everything that you read about. I think um, a great film was Boom for Real for Jean-Michel Basquiat or the Maplethorpe documents. So I scaled up to the human figure, male and female nudes with overpainting. And this was included in the San Paolo Biennale, excuse me, San Paolo Biennale in 1983. 84 called the heroic figure. There were 10 male artists um, and Maplethorpe was commissioned to do our portrait uh, was sort of the neo-expressionist movement in New York. And there were three female artists, myself, Cindy Sherman and Nancy Dwyer. On the next slide, you'll see that I returned to color. So I did have Joseph Albers uh, color theory, and uh, there was a film made at that time by Kodak where you could develop the negatives and they would come out as positive. So you printed them and they made negative image. So I'm becoming more and more interested in the materiality of the image. Uh, the negative has a significant history in the history of art. I would recommend reading. Uh, there's a short history of the shadow in art which there's a whole chapter on uh, photography. And here I'm beginning to explore color, a self-portrait. This is 83, 84. And the next slide, I believe I just got invited to work with the Polaroid Artist Support Program. And maybe John, you can uh, speak about that now. And this was done in 1983. I was invited up to Boston. Do you wanna to talk to that, John? Um, we can't You're hear muted, you. You did, John. To turn on the audio. Sorry, didn't want you to hear peripheral noise. Oh. Um, that's all right. So yes, um, sorry about that. The, so the Polaroid uh, collection and, and the artist support program actually began in the 60s as an offshoot of Dr. Land's relationship with Ansel Adams. And so it grew slowly. And then when 20 by 24 uh, was created uh, in 1978 and 79 is when it was finally really active. Uh, it really broadly expanded that group to reach out to other artists. So uh, among other artists besides Ellen, you had William Wegman, Chuck Close, um, David Leventhal, uh, Joyce Tennyson eventually, uh, Timothy Greenfield Sanders. And so it then expanded even further when the studio moved to New York City in uh, 1986, where we now were in their backyard. So previously people had to come up to Boston, which some people were glad to do, but you know, you just didn't get as much access. So we finally did move to New York. That was really the turning point as far as the 20 by 24 artist support program was, so was concerned and it really flourished at that point. So this work is my first iteration uh, using Polaroid and I did the overpainting with enamel paint and I realized that the material was so fantastic. I sort of abandoned and left behind the kind of neo-expressionist overpainting. And you'll see the next few slides from um, 84 to 87. These are multiple exposures, 85, 86. Um, just showing LCP. In this particular, oh, just go back one, Nicole. In this particular one, sorry. Um, in this particular one, I became very interested in photographic color theory, uh, which is uh, mixing light, of course, and uh, we have something called uh, RG, red, green, and blue are the primary additives. And when they mix with the subtractive, yellow, you know, magenta, cyan. So here you see red and green mixing to make yellow and red and blue mixing to make magenta. 
and the blue and the green, which is more subtle here in the self-portrait mixing cyan. So this becomes a part of my, uh, I have four uh, sort of guidelines. A lot of my projects begin, begin with questions, which I'll talk about later, but photography is all about light for me and then adding color as we move through. Um, so we can move through this, 1987. And in 1987, 88, uh, we had Black Monday in New York City. And for me, that's uh, the Polaroid 2024 program went through a lot of changes. I went back into the dark room and began doing my research on the history of photography vis-a-vis -vis the photogram, uh, which includes, of course, several avant-garde, uh, specifically Man Ray in Paris and uh, Mahali Naj and looking at uh, a lot of black and white work. Um, and this organized a question for myself, which becomes sort of my uh, framework for reference to begin my projects. And in this particular case is what is a abstract photograph? So beginning that question, and of course Talbot, as I reread Talbot and Daguerre and Anna Atkins, there was a lot of experiments there, I think Talbot did over 3,000 experiments before he got work with Sir John Herschel and got the Dick solution and Anna Atkins and cyanotype. The word cyan is Greek for blue. So many of our, the nomenclature and the language in our photography actually references the physical um, object itself. So um, that, I love that kind of kinship between light and naming the object. So here are some early 1988 pieces, photogram, and this particular, whoops, let's just go back once. Here we go. In this particular one, I recommitted myself to Polaroid. This is 1995. And this is actually a, a multiple exposure of a black and white photogram and actually it is called color theory. And you can see where the, um, the blue and the red mix, they make magenta and the green and the red are making the yellow and the blue and the green are moving to make cyan. And when they all stack up together, they make white light. So it's very different from painting. Uh, again, this references the history of photography vis-a-vis -vis as this art. I think it was uh, when it was announced by Daguerre in Paris, you know, everyone was like painting is dead. So this kind of has a lot of historical references, as well as Duchamp, the rotary, the spinning rotary. It references also chaos and order, the circle and the square. Um, I do include in the photographic object when I exhibit, which you can see at the New Britain Museum, um, the whole, the roller marks to the left and right, and the Polaroid tulips on the top, and the, um, you know, where the uh, film Motion is uh, exhausts itself on the bottom. That's sort of like I call it a bit there. So we can go on next. Um, in 1996, this represents my first Polaroid pull, P U L L, and begins the discourse uh, around my project, artistic practice called Photography Degree Zero. Again, that references Roland Barthes' writing Degree Zero, which is. Uh, commenting and framing the avant-garde in Paris vis-a-vis -vis existentialism, being in nothingness, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Albert Camus, and where there is no narrative art from the beginning, the middle, the end in literature or you know plays and storytelling. The creative act just is, say as, it just is. And that pretty much, I think for my work and Polaroid, um, represents the wonder and magic of photography. And on the left panel is a white rectangle uh, and the black conical loop. And the, uh, is the, the film, the, the chemistry is in a Polaroid pod. It's about 22 inches long, almost like a ruler. And the black right panel is all um, no exposure. So that represents not only photography degree zero, writing degree zero, but the group in the avant-garde in Europe, the zero group. 
And this is also done in Polaroid color. So it's not technically the black or white film, which you'll see later as we go along. Yes, that's okay. And here we are, you know, RGB. The pull and the rollback follows the pull. And this is 1997. Mm -hmm. Um, this is an installation I did at Real Artways, morning wall, family portrait, and birthday portrait. As we move from the 20th century into the 21st century, I was reflecting on uh, 100 years of global loss, and we did 100 negatives. This is roughly 15 feet high, the next slide, and 45 feet wide. So this is 100 black and white Polaroid negatives from oh, one to 20, 21, it goes all the way up to this idea of ascension. I was raised Catholic, which you'll see the influence of the stained glass windows and my color palette later. Um, I knew that the negatives were gonna change over time and they did, the water did evaporate and the chemicals did oxidize. And it looked like it was almost weeping. There was a lot of excess uh, chemistry that dripped and, and attached itself. Um, in the middle room was the um, next slide is family portrait. So this uh, represents, uh, I was, uh, my, my, my father died two weeks before I moved to New York and in 1995, um, so that was in 1979. And then in 1995, my mother was diagnosed with a terminal illness with 40 to 70 weeks to live. And then I had a middle brother, John, who was an AIDS doctor, and he had an accident, sudden death, uh, dying six months before my mother. So in August of 1996, I started doing research on uh, love and loss and mourning. And of course, the history of photography includes family portraits, taking pictures of children and so forth. But also when um, we have some, there, when daguerreotypes, people would lose their children. They would take pictures of them with their parents uh, floating and also make lockets with hair. So there is a history of love and loss and mourning and grief work being done in photography. So I went to the Polaroid studio in August of 1996. And this represents my version, a very minimal monochrome version of my family as it existed in 1996. The two blacks, my older, my parents, two white and my, my older brother, myself, my middle brother, John, and my two younger siblings. What was so interesting was that the negatives on the opposite wall, perpendicular here, there, there doesn't matter if they're black and white. So existentially, we know that living and dying is the same going on all the time. But here was the physical embodiment of that. So the next slide, you'll see what that looks like more in detail. It reminded me of piano keys. And this is, you know, it's non-reflective, sort of like an open burial pit. On the opposite wall is a precursor to the morning wall in 1999. Uh, Ford made some black and white films. So this is sort of like a, a family grief work around tombstones. The next slide is birthday portrait. Uh, my parents both died the day before their birthdays, um, anniversary access, and my brother about a month after his. So I queued off the gender codes, a blue for boys. So my father was blue and oxblood for March, and my mother was diamond pink, and my little brother, the last panel is um, blue and ruby and sort of birthday candles. It was sort of pulls and rollbacks, multiple things. I had a, uh, I was raised Catholic and, you know, I had a very um, non-gender. My parents were both uh, feminists and my dad had been in World War II. So they were very uh, proactive on education and having me, you know, do what I would like to do with my life. So the next slide is <clears throat> called self-portrait at 48, even though there are 50 panels, it's half the size of morning wall. And it represents the year of mourning at 26 when I lost my father and 42 when I bought my brother and my mother. And it also represents time and the clock. So uh, the top is noon, 
midnight and as we go around, see nine o'clock, six o'clock and three o'clock, the ponytail represents the female gender of, of myself as well as facing the camera looks more like a, a silhouette or, or, a, or, or, you know, a bust or head and shoulders. Representing also Polaroid, which is very well known as being a portrait uh, camera. Stopping down again with the eight by 10, the negatives are underneath F9 to F128. This idea of time passing from um, over and then going into nothingness, obviously very existential. Also done in color film with black and white. The next slide is color, RGB, yellow, magenta, cyan. These are also um, self-portraits. My next slide is, uh, this represents Saul Witt. Um, I was asked to be a matrix artist in 19, um, with the 153rd uh, matrix artist in 2004, 2005. And here was Saul Witt doing his installation. He was terminally ill at the time and I was just sort of amazed and sort of inspired by his using the bold colors knowing that he did not have a long time to live. And that sort of brought me to my Pictus and writ the Carol DeWitt and the family asked me to write an essay on his 100 views that's up at Mass Mocha now. And for that, I was, this is the Mocha North. So upstairs, the so next slide, we did photography degree zero. Um, and I used just use the monochrome, the more monochrome palette. Um, for those of you who do not know, there's the Matrix program that was started by Andrew Miller Keller at the Wadsworth in the 70s and allowed artists to present their work in a traditional museum setting. There also is uh, funding for artists to do a special project. In my case, I wanted to work with the Polaroid 40 by 80 camera, which will be coming up in the next few slides. So, um, yeah, so John, do you want to talk about the 4080 at all? Oh, you have to turn on your your mic. Oops. I don't want you to hear me making noises in the in the downtimes there. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, the 40 by 80 uh, was actually invented concurrently with the 20 by 24 in 1976 at the direction of Edwin Land. Uh, ostensibly in the beginning, it was just for uh, a shareholders meeting to make a big splash with the, uh, the release of a new peel apart film in eight by 10 format. Uh, it wasn't really intended to be these for sale with these larger formats, but the result of that was certainly the 20 by 24 because he wanted to do a live portrait from the stage at the shareholders meeting. And then the 40 by 80, which he kind of just threw out as an aside to his engineering team was to photograph uh, some uh, Renoir paintings uh, at uh, the Museum of Fine Arts to show again the high quality and, and the reprographic qualities of, of Polaroid film, which at that time was kind of a cutting edge film technologically. Uh, you know, we don't think of that today, but at that time, in terms of uh, replicating art and that sort of thing, there weren't many options for that. And so the fact that it was instant and everything, so it was primarily to copy paintings. Uh, and so it was housed at the Museum of Fine Arts, but a number of artists were invited to join and, and uh, work with it, uh, maybe maybe a dozen over the course of its history. Uh, Alan among them, uh, Chuck Close did quite a bit of work with it. The Canadian artist Evergon did uh, extensive body of work with it. Uh, Ulai and Marina, Marina Abramovic and Ulai did uh, also uh, some big series with it. So. Uh, it eventually was sold to a, a, a French-Canadian artist named Gregory Colbert, and he housed it in New York for a while, which is where Ellen worked with it uh, in the, what was it, 2003, you think, Ellen, or uh, six? 2004, or, yeah, 2004, 2004, around there. August, it was a very yeah. hot day. <laughs> eventually, uh, Gregory lost interest in it as a, as a machine for his own art, and so he did allow it to be sort of rented out, uh, but he eventually just sort of uh, didn't uh, continue with it. And uh, when Polaroid went away, there there is no longer any material for it. You know, 20 by 24 material survives through the company that I started with my investor. Uh, but 
uh, there were no takers for 40 by 80. Um, it, it's a hugely difficult machine to run. And so I personally had no interest in including it in our efforts and everything. And so after a while, unfortunately, it just sort of uh, petered out and went away, which is kind of a sad ending for it. So Eleanor was one of the last artists to work with it. I think the very last was Chuck Close in 2006. But uh, So it has a kind of a cool legacy. Very few people have seen it. Uh, there aren't many examples out in the world compared to 20 by 24. So uh, it kind of is a sort of an asterisk in the, uh, the history of uh, large format uh, instant photography. Yeah, and if we go back one slide, Nicole, you'll see that uh, this is an installation I did adjacent gallery, Morgan North at the Wadsworth. I actually made eight. There's another black one to the yeah. far left and we hung the negatives. So these are 44 inches high by 10 to 14 feet high. So yeah. they're quite large. And one of them is at the New Britain Museum in the Struck by Light show. So what's interesting about Ellen's work is that, you know, when she did her long 20 by 24 poles, which we would create by letting the camera continue to run, those were almost the same length as the 40 by 80. So when you see them together, the 40 by 80 doesn't seem nearly as gargantuan as it would say if it were portraits of something, if they were 20 by 24 portraits and 40 by 80 portraits. So uh, the scale of her 20 by 24s was actually, in some instances, pretty close to 40 by 80. And that's probably one of my concepts um, is, you know, begin with the concept, uh, but it always has to include light, context, content, and citation. Here is a panoramic view of me working at the Polaroid studio. Uh, you can see that I'm pulling up the negative from the positive in the peel apart system. And the far right, I was mixing the pods in this particular case in 2005. Every time Polaroid makes a change, I respond to that change. And in this particular instance, I started to mix the pods, uh, the black and white pod with the color pod, which references color, uh, something in chemistry and color developing called cross-processing. And I had to wear a mask over because the fumes, et cetera. So um, next slide. Back to um, color and the darkroom. I do love darkroom printing. But the conundrum was to, since it has such a uh, incredible historical legacy uh, with many photographers globally and includes many avant-garde, um, France, England, Russia, all over the world. Um, I began to think about, uh, again, what is an abstract photograph? And since my work in Polaroid was really about sort of intervention, experiment, I decided to use the push pen and I looked at Talbot's work is it be, you know, using uh, objects around in nature and Anna Atkins and lace and so forth. So I use the push pen <laughs> and here I'm, you know, puncturing the paper and going towards abstraction. I've done a lot of museum studies at the Albright Knox and various institutions and uh, Jackson Pollock of course, uh, the abstract expression is minimalism, conceptual art. And here you can see this triptych as going from maybe representation towards abstraction in this push pin photograph. So I began to become bolder in my, on uh, the next slide, um, Lynx is coming into the digital area in 2005. And this is actually uh, 40 by 60 inches of digital picture, I became very interested in the biology of seeing, and P.A. Mondrian is also, uh, you know, an exemplar of that. And this actually does move when you look in front of it and stand. And there's a series of links that I did um, at the New Britain Museum um, in the series of RGB, yellow, magenta, cyan, that are large photograms. And the next slide we can do. Uh, the pen light drawing here is Polaroid, so I'm working under a dark cloth and making a tented sort of minimal photogram, if you will. And the next one, here are the, uh, the dings and shadows begin in 2010. And this is a suite of RGB, yellow, magenta, cyan. Uh, and these are 40 inches by 30 inches wide. And again, all one of a kind, I only make unique images. 
which references Talbot, Daguerre, and, and Atkins as well. Slide. And I pulled all back the moving along here. And uh, so I'm re rolling the film and rolling it back up. And there's an example of that also at the New Britain Struck by Light show. This is the next slide is the Dings and Shadows. And this is to give you an idea of scale. Um, this is 20 color photograms, dings and shadows. Again, the ding is a professional taboo in archival museum printing. So I'm also referencing photographic color theory, RGB, yellow magenta cyan, as well as the grid uh, scaling up. So Robert Smithson said um, scale could be, you know, a crack in a wall or the Grand Canyon. So again, referencing minimalism, um, abstract expressionism, conceptual art, earthworks, which is our avant-garde uh, art movements in America. And then this is there's something in photography called the slit filter, and again referencing that. So this is also a centerpiece of the New Britain show. Let's drop my light. And I'm pulling it all back in 2016. And being in the shadow triptych. And this is a project that was I was working on in 2015 um, that's been accepted uh, by the Museum of Terrorism in Paris, which was put on hold because of COVID. Um, so this is a, um, a pull with a half line and a half circle. Representing. And this is my Man Ray discovery. Again, you saw the pen lights early on that I was working with and all throughout. And here is a very tiny photograph. It's about uh, it's a contact print. It's actually very dark, so we can go to the next slide. Um, there is reversal, this idea of reversal, and the next slide you'll see uh, there it is reversed and flipped, which represents the camera obscura, and the next slide you'll see his name. So this was a discovery, I guess my work in retrospect, the DNA of my visual thinking and intelligence is around discovery, so experiment with discovery. And I wrote an um, essay about this as well. And it had been missed by many scholars for over 75 years. And it made me realize that we as picture makers, uh, and then there are scholars and curators, really there's a kind of gap in, in communication and visual thinking because uh, I've talked to many, um, Larry Schaff and Mary Foresta and uh, Henry Adams, who wrote the book about Jackson Pollock and Thomas Hart Benton. And they both, he taught at the Kansas City Art Institute, and Jackson Pollock went there for a little while. So that there's a big difference between the making of the image and the, the person looking at it. So I'm moving towards more collaborative efforts that way. And the next slide. Um, this is the Polaroid project. So John, maybe you want to talk about this. Um, this is a International traveling show, nationally and internationally. <clears throat> Hold on, got to unmute first. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, this originated from the remnants of the Polaroid collection, which, as many, well, maybe you may or may not know, it was part of it was sold at auction after Polaroid went bankrupt for the second time in 2008. And uh, Quite a few pieces were sort of skimmed from that, uh, amongst them Warhols and Chuck Closes and Ansel Adams. And so it was all auctioned at Sotheby's for $12 million at a certain point to pay all the creditors. And so that was the first sort of break of the collection that uh, had been put together. And so a young man named Nathan Bruckner purchased the remnants of it, uh, somewhere around 12,000 images, of which there is still a lot of great art in there. Um, particularly 20 by 24s. Um, um, many of my clients from the New York studio certainly are represented there. And uh, so this show originated at the Eamon Carter in Texas. Is that correct, Ellen, I think? And yes, it is. For embarking on a worldwide tour, of which it's still on. Um, I think it's in Vietnam now. Am I correct there? Yeah, uh, it Ellen? started at the Eamon Carter in New York City, and then it went to um, Cologne, Hamburg, and Berlin, where John Mai saw the exhibition at CO in Berlin. Then it traveled to Singapore, and then it went to Montreal, the Museum of uh, Art there. Um, and then it went to MIT, 
where John and I were scheduled to do a live session with uh, one of the 2024 cameras there. Unfortunately, COVID came in and then stopped, uh, but it's been restarted and I believe it's in um, in Vietnam and, and Portugal. So you'd have to go online. To they're they're not doing the most efficient shipping worldwide. <laughs> it's kind of bouncing back and forth around the globe, which uh, isn't the best way, but I guess they're just responding to where there's interest and everything. And it's actually one of the, the best survey shows that I think have been done post Polaroid. Uh, there was another good one at Vassar College, but but I think this one really uh, just the breadth of it and uh, the artists that are in it, uh, uh, it's probably one of the best shows that that I think has been put together. And it's online. It's uh, organized by the Foundation of Exhibiting Photography, so www.fep, um, you know, dot org, and with MIT. And this is the cover. Um, this was published by. Uh, Thames and Hudson in London, and I can no longer find this book. So uh, the University of California has a different iteration with um, um, a different cover than what's on the back, but it's a great, it's really a terrific book and the essays are wonderful. And it really gives a really great picture of, you know, Polaroid art and technology. And it's really a terrific read. So. Hopefully it'll come back to the United States at some point. But we'll let you know. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so with the uh, change in Polaroid, again, I was mixing the pods. The black conical loop, which represents a parabola. I did talk to a colleague of mine um, who's a physicist, and the parabola is in the conical loop. So I'm very interested in fractal geometry and the circle and the square and the nautilus uh, shell and the golden knee. So that black parabola, which is at the end of a comet, is, is replaced here in the black and white mixing of the pod with color uh, with these striations. And you can see the, the pods um, are no longer single pods. They were breaking in transit and you needed two pods taped together, um, they were in sections of thirds. So I was mixing a black and white pod, um, which was quite viscous with a uh, one that was done in sections of thirds. And John, you might wanna talk about the change in the shipping and the chemistry, um, et cetera. You are working with Jerry Gnomes now, who's the chemist. So. Uh, shipping is, always has been and continues to be a nightmare <laughs> to ship these large materials because number one, it's a, it's a toxic material. It's got a pH of 13. Uh, it's in little packets that are designed to break under pressure. So uh, shipping them internationally, which I just did a shipment to China recently, and we had some small issues, not huge issues, but uh, that continues to vex us. So, uh, you know, when Polaroid shipped way back in the day, they would often ship tanks of material over, and then they would make the pods over in Europe because they had a they had a facility there. So we're not we're not privy to any of that. So uh, it's it's a a real impediment to to getting things around the world. But uh, here in the U.S., it's a lot a lot easier. We just make it and we drive it wherever we want to go. So that makes it a lot easier. And when I research the history of photography, I think. Um... One of the questions that was asked for me when I did a talk at the Benton Art Museum uh, a couple of weeks ago was the labor behind making a picture. So I think um, that is being researched uh, now by a lot of, as well as, uh, you know, the performative space of the darkroom, et cetera, by different scholars uh, that I've communicated with. Can we have the next slide? And these are some dings and shadows. 2016. Uh, this is a book I did with the Amy Carter when I had a solo show there called uh, uh, Dings, Pulls, and Shadows, um, limited edition. I made 200 zero grams. So the zero gram is, I have to work in total darkness in the color darkroom. The paper is everything is so sensitive. So I have to set myself up. And this represents that um, zero light as well as photography degree zero. So this is a book I did through the Ava Carter. Um, we made 200, it's a limited edition book and I wrote an essay for that as well as for the Polaroid project, which is saw that book. I'm also writing about my own work. Chisara 
is Italian for break. Uh, it can, usually is used in music and poetry. So this break between uh, digital and analog photography. These are uh, these are roughly uh, 40 inches high and 30 inches wide and also referencing the um, Kodak when bankrupt, I think in 2011. So there was a break in production as well. And the paper, the Kodak Endura paper, which was pre-cut to size, so now I'm working on Fuji crystal color paper. So next is, these are some more days of shadows. And here's a zero gram. Um, <clears throat> a lot of my work, I can't always go into the dark room or can always work at Polaroid. So I do a lot of research and reading about other artists' lives. And I began to notice that a lot of women use color. And this begins my research on women in color photography, beginning with Anna Atkins, the first, considered the first woman cameraless operator. Uh, photographers were called cameraless operators in the 19th century. And as we move through science and art and technology, catch up to us, um, there was a discovery in, um, you know, a few years before 2017, that uh, women who carry a DNA called tetra, or for tetra being Greek for four, chromacy can discern color better than men who have a 20 to 30% higher rate of color blindness. So this reframes Linda Nochlin's question or where are all the great women artists that she wrote in 1971. So in 2017, I was approached by the rubber factory on Lower East Side to do a show of my own choice. And I chose to do Women in Color, the first iteration here, celebrating the history of color as a universal language and certainly color of photography. And then it was also done in Paris, which is the next slide. <clears throat> and here I discovered Claire Aho, who's a Nor um, one of the Norwegian, I think she's Finnish, Scandinavian countries who in the 50s had her own color uh, studio, did uh, her husband did film, and she did large format uh, color uh, photographs. And that's also being uh, celebrated at the V&A in England with a woman named Yvette, Yvonne. I'm not saying her name right, of course. So this idea of color and women practitioners. Um, also, I discovered in the England, there were uh, women practitioners who were called amateur painters in watercolor, which was a very popular 14th, 15th century. And then we have the Italian Artemisi Gentile, who, of course, I'll, I'll show you what I can do with this hand. And that show was just at the Wadsworth name. There's a lot of color in uh, work at the Newbert Museum as well. And I'm continuing to work on this project. It's sort of an open-end research uh, project, hopefully to uh, get it established in a, a gallery or a commercial space or maybe um, a museum in England soon. So um, next slide is, and here's some Polaroid 2024 um, negatives. And the next slide, is their positives RGB yellow. So I'm crushing the negative. I'm taking my ding and shadow idea. I'm crushing the negative, which I also have to do in the dark and then re-rolling it into the camera. Um, next slide. And I love, you know, photography. I was traveling a lot for COVID. So I decided to uh, photograph, return to the self-portrait again and call it hello again. Um, and I went to visit my aunt in Columbus, Ohio, who's a nun, and she had never seen an iPhone before. So this kind of, again, um, you know, drew inspiration. So the top row is she and I taking pictures together. And of course, I had to you know, come up with the characteristics of my film um, projects, photography projects, reflection, refraction. The middle panel almost says hello. And then hello was uh, Stephen Jobs, whose role model was Edwin Land of Polaroid and his iPhone, when his first campaign came out, was called hello. So, and I call this hello again. So the next slide. And this is a black triptych with crush and pull, uh, 2018. Next slide. 
RGB on the top, yellow, magenta, cyan, the primary additives and subtractives. There's a flare in the middle. <clears throat> Next slide. And here I am um, pulling off the negative to the positive, and you can see the Polaroid pot right there. And I believe I'm the only person that keeps the negatives in the Polaroid 2024. This is a collaboration we did with the Delamar, the New Britain Art Lights Camera. I was thinking Lights Camera Action. <clears throat> there's a Chisara there. And this, there's the brochure. In 2021, uh, the late Elsa Dorfman's camera came into my studio in Hartford. And here we did a series of work. Um, we were in COVID, so uh, we did a series of pulls and rollback, basically working one Saturday a month for that year. Um, Don Hill approached me in uh, February, March, and you can go onto my website and see that film here. So you see RGB, yellow magenta cyan. Also, someone mentioned who does a lot of video that looks like bars here. So each one of these Polaroid pulls also has two negatives with it. The next slide, we can go here. Um, Dings and Shadows in 20, went back into the dark room, 2021, uh, adding gray to my palette. And here's the pen lights again, revisited, crush and pull with rollbacks and pen lights. And here is the piece fe featured at the New Britain Museum, uh, crush and pull with hands. I'm starting to do research on the hands. In Talbot's hand, he's got a very iconic image and pen lights. And the next image is uh, a kind of call and response I did to Talbot's a cascade of spruce needles at the Fox Talbot Museum. So this is crush and pull with hands, pen lights, and spruce needles, which is an iconic abstract photograph, 1839. And we have a, a blue. Benton Museum, I just did this um, great exhibition. Oh, terrific. Nancy Stula did that. And I think we have one more. Okay, here we have in Paris, this just opened uh, Noir au Blanc or Blanc and Noir, black and white. And the zero gram is uh, featured in the show on the materiality of the photograph, of the photographic object. So that's just opened, I think last week, a couple of weeks ago. And Black Noir Blanc, uh, Black and White, also has a monochrome Polaroid dip deck. So I think that's, there's the scale of the zero grams. And here is the Fox Talbot reference to the Cascade of Spruce Needles, 1839. Um, the installation goes RGB, yellow magenta cyan, and then we have a red negative there. So I'm very interested in the negative image not only in its philosophical content and legacy and history um, with Plato's Cave, but also uh, Oscar Rylander's image called The First Negative, which begins this idea of creativity and so forth. And here we have, I think that's it. So we can have time for some questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, John. So we do have three. Sorry. About my throat. Sorry, I didn't expect that. Okay. Do you have um, some questions in the chat room or anybody? Yeah, I was, sent, I was sent three questions. Um, the first one is for you, Ellen. Thank you for taking us on this journey through your career. Can you take us on a journey of your daily working routine? How do you structure your day in and out of the studio? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, well, I teach full time at the Hartford Art School. And that is basically, you know, 10 months of the year there. I try to book some time in the dark room on my breaks in the summer, as well as, uh, you know, uh, you know, breaks at Christmas time or when we have our spring breaks. Um, I pretty much am a morning person. So I get up between, you know, around six, 6.30 and just kind of get going. Um, and then I work on the Polaroid camera as much as possible. Basically, that's uh, you know around raising funds and so forth. I try to you know go to movies, read books, 
I'm constantly buying books, but I don't often have the great thing about the COVID besides Zoom was I got to read a lot of books. So I felt like I could catch up on my culture uh, with Hulu and Netflix and but you know, I try to go go for walks, look at nature. Um, the interesting thing also when we brought the camera into my studio, I my apartment at that time looked out over the Bushnell Park in downtown Harper, which was incredible. So I got to Re reintroduce uh, an observing nature and light and shadow and the seasons and color. So, um, but pretty much I'm I'm you know working seven days a week. I mean they do I do try to take off uh, one day. Friday is definitely my studio day, and Saturday Sundays you know I try. It depends on. I mean I just finished six one person shows, so I started teaching, and I don't know. It depends. Really, but I don't know if that helps or not. But our next question is for um John. It says, "What is next for you? What are you most excited about?" <laughs> um, well, we we are continuing to uh, to work on the the remnants of twenty by twenty four. Uh, it, it's an increasing challenge. Uh, you know, we spun out in uh, two thousand nine, thinking that we you know, we bought a whole bunch of film from Polaroid, the old Polaroid, and thought it would last three to five years. And now we're 12 years out uh, with materials that were made and coded in 2006. So we're at a place where we, we never should have made it. The, the project shouldn't exist anymore, and it still does. So it's a continuing challenge. So uh, that's kind of taking up a lot of my time trying to do it. We, we recently got a new, new client in China. They're very excited about it. They had a, they commissioned a camera and built one. Uh, unfortunately, it was delayed almost two years. We also were delayed by COVID. So it's all those challenges that everybody else has faced certainly had a huge impact on us. But we made it through, and uh, we'll see. Uh, it's, uh, it's a miracle you know, we can make anything. Sometimes when I look back at all the challenges, yeah, I sure. and the crash of 87, uh, you know, when I read about Talbot's experiments and, you know, it's really quite a, when I read about Edward Curtis, there's a new film coming out on Lee Miller. Um, so we're, we face a lot of challenges, but I think we're really good at problem solving and that just comes, comes with it, I think, you know, the challenges. I get, but I love the dark room. I love working in photography. So it, for me, it represents freedom to answer that person's previous question about my schedule is really, it's, it's so freeing. And, you know, I was really uh, in the existential crisis and, and, you know, Kansas City artists because I, my mother and father told me I was creative, but I didn't know what I was creative at. So, you know, and Talbot couldn't draw either. So he couldn't draw or paint. His wife Constance did so, and I think um, Edwin Land tells the story when he was with his daughter, and I believe the story goes. John can, um, you know, chip in here is that you know, Dad, how come I can't see it right away? So he he, you know, got this eureka moment and came up with uh, the Polaroid in I think twenty four hours. So. Uh, you know, it's really a combination of inspiration, innovation. It's really changed our world. I mean, photography has completely changed our world. Um, and you can communicate visually. So that is proven since the cave paintings that we are visual. Uh, our humanity is visual. So we can cut across global culture, class, race, et cetera. So age. Yeah. We have one last question before we end. Um, it's for Ellen. How did your relationship with the New Britain Museum of American American Art begin, and how did how has it evolved? Oh, that's a great question. I love museums. I I live around them all the time. So the Nelson Atkins in Kansas City. Um, my dad worked in Manhattan, so I was constantly going to the Met, the MoMA, uh, the Guggenheim. Um, I believe it was Doug Highland who started the New Now project. Uh, so my first exhibition there, solo exhibition, was in two, 2002. Um, museums are a great resource, visual, uh, the Wadsworth. Uh, you know, I love 
all museums all over the world. I try to go to them as much as possible. Um, and then I believe with Douglas Min also uh, came to talk to me about my work and we started to talk more and more about gifting work to them and do working. She was the one who the acquisitions committee got that big 4080, uh, which I only did eight. And that's the only one that's not in black or red. It's sort of the, uh, the kind of, you know, uh, dark brown, walnut brown with the, the kind of uh, beige on top. So, and then when Brett Abbott, who I had mentioned, met at the, uh, the, um, Damon Carter in New York, I mean, in, excuse me, uh, Fort Worth, Texas. So he was uh, working with the curator there, John Orbach on my solo exhibition. So I think museums are, are fantastic. Um, they're public facing, they serve the public. Um, you know, I really wanna honor that by serving the public as well with my exhibitions as much as possible. And I also did a lot of museum studies and art history uh, when I was in um, Buffalo at the Albright Knox, which was also represent the avant-garde um, and did a lot of, uh, was a curatorial assistant there. So museums are fantastic. And um, I highly recommend that we all, you know, you all do great work. The docents do great work and everybody that works in them. So, um, and what will be the future? I don't know. We'll just keep on talking. The Fox Talbot Museum, you know, everything went through a big uh, pause and uh, realignment with COVID. So I'm working with um, a different generation coming up. And I would highly recommend Andy Grumberg's book, you know, How Photography Became Contemporary Art, uh, The Revolution from, you know, pop to the digital to understand the context because you really, there really was these institutions are just now, you know, not now beginning because the Getty, of course, um, you know, we're 40 years into contemporary photography as art. So um, there was really no place to study and they've always been really, the museums first showed photography first. They've always first shown it. Victoria and Albert Museum in England um, had Juliet Margaret Cameron, using their studios. So, sorry, oh, my phone's ringing. And it's a new phone. So yeah, the museums have always been very uh, supportive of photography and new new, new mediums, new, new ideas in, in art, visual thinking. So I hope to keep continuing, of course. Thank you, Ellen and John for joining us today. And thank you everyone that attended. Um, have a good Sunday. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for everyone for coming. Thank you.